Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. It's my great pleasure, folks, great pleasure to introduce my old friend, former next door neighbor, if you can remember that I far do. back in Gables by the Sea, very pretentious name, but that's where we live. The writer who the New York Times called the funniest man in America, I call him the real Florida man, <laughs> who, speaking for everybody here, all the folks at home, all the ships at sea, we're so happy, Dave, that after 10 years, you're back with another novel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm personally happy, since we're the same age, that at your age, you can still type all these words. <laughs> what, uh, what got you back into the fiction game, pal? Um, nothing particular, really. I just needed, I had to write another book. And, no, it's kind of, and, and, and um, I had a, a bunch of ideas. Uh, I live in Miami. I moved there in 1986 from the United States. And, <laughs> Bada boom. And, and Miami is a, uh, if you're a humorist, it's a target-rich environment. Um, <laughs> Carl Hyacin, the great Florida writer, good friend of mine, uh, is always saying that uh, if you, if you want to be a novelist, you live in Florida, you don't need an imagination, you just need a subscription to the Miami Herald. <laughs> and things keep happening there, as you know, you live there, that don't happen anywhere else. And uh, a, a bunch of things kind of conspired to make me think that I could, I could incorporate them in a, in a book. But that has happened ever since I moved there. Um, when, when I first got to, to Miami, one of the first columns I wrote, this is a long time ago, um, there was a story in the paper, and I just couldn't believe it. And I've learned to believe it if it's in the. And, and I went to investigate it, and it, it was uh, okay. There's a in Homestead, which is a city south of Miami. There's a uh, there was a, a citizens' crime watch forming in this little community, a little suburban community, and they invited the chief of police, a guy named Kurt Ivey, to come and speak and explain how the citizens' crime watch would work with the police force of Homestead. So it's a nice night and they're holding the meeting on a patio outdoors. Kurt, as chief of police, is explaining how it's gonna work and he's almost hit on the head by a 75 pound bale of cocaine falling from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> that really happened and it was a smuggler's plane coming over from the Bahamas and it was intercepted by a custom service jet and they were forcing the smugglers down, so they're flinging these bales of cocaine out. And they, they flung 20 of them out before they were forced down in Naples on the other side of the state, which set off a treasure hunt in the Everglades. Uh, but the point is, the chief of police at a Citizens Crime Watch meeting is almost killed by falling cocaine. Now, you're a writer. I'm a writer. If you write that and send it to an editor, or, they're going to no say way. that, no, come on. No way. That's, but it happened, and that's the kind of thing that happens n not infrequently at all yes. in Miami and, and Florida in general. So um, they, they sort of accumulate, and over the years, I, I, there were several things that happened that made me want to write, put them in a book, and that's why I wrote this one. And for this one, uh, did anything inspire you to leave your house in Coral Gables, drive 40 miles to the Everglades, to the Everglades. And write a book that's got uh, buried treasure, a 300-pound boar named Buddy, a 12-foot An emotional python. support boar. An emotional support boar. 
owned by a wonderful character, a little uh, old scalawag named Skeeter, who uh, rides in his airboat with Buddy. But there's also a python. There's also, of course, an alligator. By the way, Carl Hyacin did call. He wants his cover back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, you've got the Bortle Brothers Beer and Bait Shop. You've got a, so, some uh, Russian gangsters, right? You've got some redneck thugs. You have an adorable heroine. And you somehow managed to get them all in one scene. You forgot the time-traveling chiropractor. The <laughs> But I, I can admit a it's a little bit of a cliche, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were not on drugs when you wrote this. <laughs> no, it, the, the, the one, the, I mean, yeah. The I, the thing of all those things you mentioned. Yes. The one that that um, and and I, it's a lot of people don't realize the geography of it, but if you've ever flown into Miami, it's right next to the Everglades. I mean, one minute you're over swamp, and the next minute you're over a dense urban area and it's only a couple miles wide most of the state is swamp but if you live in Miami you are never more than like 20 minutes from the swamp well in bad traffic you're a little longer but but it's it's right there so the 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 item the element the the event that really got me out there that that I wanted to write about in this book is a thing called the uh, the python challenge okay. which when People keep asking me, did I make it up? Right. And I didn't make it up. It's real. Um, and it's so Florida. It's the most Florida thing. Uh, we have a problem in, in Florida with Burmese pythons, which are these gigantic constrictor snakes. They get to be 15 feet long. And uh, they shouldn't be there. They should be in, <laughs> in Burma, <laughs> um, and, which is now Myanmar, I think, which is why I guess they don't go back. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> But what happened was people had these as, as pets, these gigantic snakes, and then these people ran out of crack and, <laughs> and realized they were living with gigantic constrictor snakes. And, and so they let them go. And, um, and the pythons love it. They thrive. They're like New Yorkers. And they just they can't get enough of Florida. And uh, they multiply. They have no natural enemies down there. They eat all the other wildlife. And so the estimates now are that there are hundreds of thousands of these pythons out there. And um, the state of Florida, to deal with that, and this is just the, I still can't believe this is real, but it is. Uh, about 10 years ago, they started this contest called the Python Challenge, which basically they invite anybody who wants to to come to Florida and kill our pythons. And it attracts a, just the kind of people <laughs> who would see that as a fun thing to do. And there are, there are cash prizes for the most pythons and the longest python. And it's, it's run by the state, so there's like a, a certain organization to it. The Florida State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Go to the website if you uh, want to see what you need to do. But you have to you fill out a registration form. You have to, I think you have to pay a fee. And you have to take a brief online course in python killing. <laughs> Ask anybody who's ever dealt with dangerous animals in the wild how you learn to do that. A brief online course is... <laughs> and the, the reason for the course is the way you have to kill the pythons in a certain way, a, a humane way. Like, I would just whack the python's head off, but you're not allowed to do that because it's inhumane, and it, it, this is what it says on the website, because when you cut off the head of the python, the brain keeps working, so the python is still thinking, okay? They don't say what it's thinking. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit, you know? Like, then, uh, so you have to kill it by destroying the brain with a, either a bullet, which is not the approved way, or a thing that... Anyway, so every year, we have this python challenge, every year. And every year they announce, they, they have a big thing when they launch it, and then they have a big thing when they announce the results. And every year they kill like two to 300 pythons. So like, do the math. <laughs> There's hundreds of thousands of pythons out there. They're killing two or 300. And meanwhile, all the female pythons are laying like 100 eggs apiece. So the pythons are winning. <laughs> They're killing us in the python challenge. That's, that's the point. We should have challenged some animal that we could beat. 
like the, the manatees or something. You, know? you, you would think with all the automatic weapons in South Florida, it, it would be a, better than 200. But I think the pythons also have the automatic oh. weapon. And that, they may have gotten hold of the cocaine that was that dropped would, that out of there. So anyway, the, so, so that I wanted very much to include the, the pythons. I wanted this, the beginning of the idea of this book was that this was going on out there, and that there had to be a story that I could build around that. And TikTok plays quite a role in this story. And would it be fair to say that you are not uh, enamored of social media and viral stuff? Well, no, I'm, I'm more just fascinated <clears throat> by it. Um, I have a daughter who's 23 years old, and, and uh, I want to stress here that she's a perfectly intelligent person with a job, but she, she is into TikTok, and she got me to you know, start, and for the, those of you who are like me, old people, TikTok is this app that was invented by China to keep us from ever doing anything productive <laughs> ever again in this country. They're over there making things, you know, like computers and cars and and televisions, and we're over here going, oh my God, look at that dog. <laughs> oh my, look at they're doing a dance. Oh, yeah. Look, she can make ravioli with a tennis racket. Oh my God. It's like, and then before you know it, it's like nighttime and you're still in your pajamas. And over there, they've made like 800 million more computers in China. So anyway, these guys, in the, in the book, I, I, I was really kind of interested in the whole idea that Anybody with a phone can make a video, and if just the right circumstances happen, this video can be seen by tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of people. And so what happens in the, in the book, uh, I don't want to get too much of the plot away, but there are these guys out in the Everglades who are not that bright, and <laughs> they smoke a tremendous amount of weed, which makes them even stupider, basically. And they hatch this plan to create this creature called the Everglades Melon Monster, which they want to, they want to you know, have people come out and buy T-shirts. Basically, that's their idea. Um, and it's based on this real thing in the Everglades <laughs> called the, the Skunk Ape. There's a, in the middle of the Everglades, there's a Skunk Ape Research Headquarters, which is basically, the Skunk Ape is this like Yeti-like thing, and the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters is basically, they sell T-shirts. <laughs> so anyway, these guys come up with this plan and the, they, they talk to this guy who's a, an alcoholic ex-newspaper man who desperately needs money. That's based on me. And <laughs> they, they talk this guy into, he needs money bad, into dressing up. He puts on a Dora the Explorer costume head. It's like this big. And they shoot it in low light, and he staggers around the Everglades. And Anyway, it's a terrible idea, <laughs> but he gets on TikTok, and it becomes, because of nothing they did right, huge. And, I mean, internationally huge. And thousands of people come to the Everglades to buy T-shirts. To see the, to see the Everglades you, melon you, monster. You yeah. ridicule these TikTokers. It's I do. I don't yes. think a lot of them. <laughs> yes. But yeah. they, they are, like, economically very powerful. May I say that I think, that, and I've read all your books, 743 of them, if you count the children's books, the pirate books, the nonfiction. Um, Dave Barry turns 40, Dave Barry turns 50. <laughs> Next up, Dave Barry turns 80. We'll oh, yeah. be waiting for that one. I'm, I'm, this is a just one for the record, I'm 75, which is the new 73. So it's like... <laughs> anyway. The record stands corrected. Yeah. I think that it's a caper. Can I use that word? It's a caper. caper. It's a wacky it's a romp of chaotic, a caper. Chaotic caper. Hijinks ensue. Hijinks. It's fun, but you're also saying stuff. I, I don't want to get too thematic here, but you are. But you're, you'll never admit it. You'll never say, oh, I'm trying to make this point about this. Will you? No. No. <laughs> no, I, whenever, when I'm right, all I ever want to do is entertain people, and that's all I've ever wanted to do. Like, I, I for many years, wrote a humor column, and um, I, I, people were so nice and sweet, and people would say to me, um, like, you know, I read your column, I read your column with my dad, and, you know, like, and, and it really was so great, it helped so much, and you do so much good with your humor. And I always feel guilty, because I think, well, I would do it even if it hurt people, because <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the only skill I have, you know. So Let me say it's very modest of Dave say I used to write a humor column, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. 
Yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Although, yeah. I just want to say this for any young journalism students out there. If you just say you want a Pulitzer Prize, people will believe you. <laughs> yeah. And eventually you'll get in Wikipedia because no one ever checks that. Okay. Well, just a little, it's true. little journalism tip. It's true. Also, a television series named after you, based yeah. on you. Um, people subscribed to the Miami Herald in the old days just to read Dave and Carl. Carl's. Um, oh, yeah. Can I just explain? I want to. Can, the blurbs. I guess, I'm so proud of the blurb. I'm more proud of the blurbs than I am of the book. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Just for the record, everybody knows this. Blurbs are bullshit. We all know that, right? Everybody is sophisticated outs. When you write a book, your publisher says, ask your friends for blurbs, and they give you blurbs. And they never go, eh, you know, they always go, this is a great book, I love this book. Riveting. Riveting. And so I asked two people for blurbs, uh, Carl Hyacin and Steve Martin. And, and Carl read the book and wrote a very nice blurb, which is the first blurb. Steve wrote back, and I've, I've known him for years, I, I was a writer for him when he, he uh, hosted the Oscars a couple of times. And, uh, he wrote back, I'm really busy, he was shooting this, this uh, show, Only, Only Murders in the Building. He said, I, I can't do that right now, but here. And he wrote five blurbs. He said, just pick, make, missing that. <laughs> so you used so them all. I used all five. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there are six blurbs on this book. One is from Carl, and five are from Steve Martin. <laughs> and the last one is my favorite. It's, I haven't read it yet, but I love it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So honest, honest blurbs, folks. Finally. Well, that was thematic material, I think. Yeah. Um, you've sold movie rights to this baby. Yeah, that's right. So, Which means it'll never be made into a movie. <laughs> yeah, and you, no. you people live in L.A., you know how that works. But it's highly They, they love it. Art. Everybody loves it. It will never be a movie. You know, I actually did have a movie, a book made into a movie. Yes, you did. The first novel I wrote was called Big Trouble. And... And everybody told me, eh, you know, they're going to say they're going to make a movie. They'll never make a movie. And they, they, they bought it, and they made it, they made it into a movie. There was a nuclear bomb in that movie. There was. And, in fact, um, like, like I'm going to refer back to Carl Hyacinth's thing about you just need a subscription to the Herald. One of the key um, elements of the plot of Big Trouble was that there were Russians selling nuclear weapons out of a bar in Miami. And every, everybody asked me, where did you get that wacky idea? And I said, I got it from an article in the Miami Herald <laughs> about Russians selling nuclear weapons out of a bar in Miami. It was shut, <laughs> shut down by the FBI. So that really di did happen. Yeah. They're going to make this movie. Okay. Well, they're going to make this movie. Okay. And if you guys don't want to read the book, just wait for the movie. It'll be a very good movie. <laughs> what are you working on now, pal? A memoir, which well, is a little weird. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a big job. Yeah, well, I, it feels really pretentious. I'm not really a, you know, um, you would, a memoir kind of guy, but uh, I have a great editor at Simon & Schuster, and, and we talked about it, and, and she said, you know, you should do it. So I'm writing a memoir. And it's been interesting um, because I, I've started with, I don't want to get too technical here, my youth. <laughs> and... and one of the questions I've been asked a lot over the, over the years is like, you know, where, where, do you, where do you get your sense of humor? And like, I actually can tell you where I got my sense of humor. I can identify specifically, it was my mom. I had a, a very funny mom. Um, and I know a lot of people think they have funny moms. My mom was dark, edgy, funny. And this is like, okay, I grew up in the 50s in a little town called Armonk, New York, small town. And now it's not so much, now it's kind of a boutique suburb of New York. But back then it was a real little town. And my mom was a housewife, which is what a lot of women were in the 50s. And they, she had four of us, so she was busy taking care of four of us. And, uh, but she had this edge to her that I didn't realize um, at the time when I got older and you know, saw how other moms were, I began to more realize. But like we had a pond behind our house. And when my sister and I were like little, like five and six, seven years old, we used to go out and play in the pond, you know, and like, I, can you imagine it now, like, you know, the federal pond police <laughs> would arrest your parents, but we just went out and did, and I remember like, we'd go out and my mom would open the kitchen window and go, don't drown kids, you know, 
And, but that was humor. And we go, we won't. You yes, know, great. And then, okay. And, and, um, and, and like, we, 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 she would take us, like, you know, down when she had to do errands in Armok and go to the, you know, the cleaners and the drugstore and whatever. We go to Brissetti's Market. And all the tradespeople love my mom. Um, and Ray Brissetti would be slicing bologna, you know, and he'd go, how you doing, Marion? And she'd go, just shitty, Ray. You know, and <laughs> she was just like that. And, like, when things something bad would happen, she would go, don't worry, kids, someday we'll all be dead, you know, <laughs> and, but we just took, that was funny to us, I was like, no. and like, um, one, one last one, about, now that you know my mom a little, when my dad, when my dad died, we buried him um, in a, the Middle Patton Cemetery, we had his ashes in a box, and after this, the funeral service, just the immediate family, my, my mom, my sister, my two brothers, and me, took my dad's ashes to the, the cemetery and they had dug a hole and it was like raining gray day, you know. And uh, we, we put the box in the, in the ground and covered it with dirt and we all said some things and, and we're all like weeping, you know, and then we're, we're walking away from the grave and I have my arm around my mom and she looks down and sees a grave marker and goes, so that's why we don't see him around anymore, you know. <laughs> How could you not become a humorist? Exactly. She never, you know, she was always doing that. And, and like, there was nothing you couldn't make a joke about in, that, in our family. And the worst thing you could do was take anything, especially yourself, uh, too seriously. So that sort okay. of like, a, you know, going back there and starting to write about, and I'm just hoping it doesn't end up being a, a, just another boring boomer thing. And I'm... No, I think that I think people want to know. Steve Martin loves it already. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's people want to know what makes you tick. Well, I don't know why they would want to know that. Well, back to Miami a second. I can't tell. I've known you a long time. If you love Miami to death or you hate Miami or you simply see it from a, that skewed point of view that you have. Oh, I love Miami. Um, okay. And I'm just a little defensive about Miami. Like, uh, people think it's dangerous and violent, and, and, and like, it's, it's really not as bad as people think it is. In fact, I had bumper stickers made up once that said, come back to Miami, we weren't shooting at you. <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm a real booster of <laughs> Miami. But, but I'm, I also, like, I can't leave. I am married to a Cuban Jewish woman, a Juban, that they call themselves. They do. They didn't come over on rafts. They parted the Caribbean. And <laughs> be between the Jewish and the Cuban, there's no way I can ever leave that, that city. But I love it. It's like it's the least boring place I've ever lived. There was another bumper sticker that you didn't make, but I remember seeing it on the way to, to the airport in Miami. It said, honk if you've never seen an Uzi fired through a car window. <laughs> real. That, that, one, that one was real. And that'd be the only time people wouldn't hawk. Yeah. And so, a memoir, a movie to be, you're, you're not going to slow down? You're not going to uh, put your feet up, take it easy, walk Lucy? I Lucy's do. the dog. Not a, yeah. No, I mean, no. I, why would I stop, right? It's fun. It's interesting. That's you, it. That's not my... That's <laughs> <laughs> Also, they, they pay you to write books. I don't know if you're aware of that. Well, when, when, the, when my books... Well, okay, they pay me to write yeah. books. Yeah. <laughs> or in Hollywood, and my lawyer, Michael Tenter, is here. Yeah. They never say, we love it, we love it. They say, like it, don't love it. <laughs> After... You're, hey, are you on a book tour? I am on a book tour. I've been on a... a anything fun happen on the book tour? <laughs> Well, um, I've been going on book tours for 40 years, so... I'll I, bet you have some good stories. <laughs> Paul is setting me up here like a professional. Like a, a little lob there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And th this, this kind of has been coming back to me. My, my 40 years ago was when I started, I started writing books, and the tours I was doing back then were like, they would consist of almost... Nothing, basically, go to, you know, go to one bookstore, whatever. But in 1984, um, when I, I had a, the book out, it was my second book, and it was called The Taming of the Screw, which was a, par a little tiny book by Rodale Press. It was a parody of a do-it-yourself book. 
And I living, at this time, I'm living in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. And I've never traveled for a book tour. I've never been on television, just like little local things. I got a call in, in my house in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, from this woman. And I later learned that she was kind of a legend in her field. Her name was Shirley Wood. And she was a booker for The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson. And somehow she had gotten this little, little book and she was a, like a tough old broad, Shirley Wood, like smoked, you know, and everything. And, and she goes, I got your book. It's funny. Are you funny? <laughs> <laughs> so she, she starts asking me questions about, um, about the book, and I would answer them, and she'd listen to the answer and go, okay, that's good, that's good. No, don't say that. Don't say that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, she liked my answers enough that she booked me on The Tonight Show. And those of you who remember The Tonight Show, like, that was huge to get on The Tonight Show. Like, there were stand-up comedians who spent their entire careers desperately trying to get on it once, you know. And here I was like this nobody author, and all this was new to me, but they, I they get on a plane in Philly, fly to, here to LAX, they pick me up at the airport in a limo, I've never been in a limo, take me to the studio, directly to the studio, and there are like these dressing rooms with stars on them, and there's like Dick Cavett, the Pointer Sisters, Dave Barry, you know, that, that, and, and like... That should be on TikTok. It should. <laughs> and, and so, like, I'm in my, my dressing room, and, like, next door I can hear the, the Pointer Sisters have their whole entourage, you know, hair people and dress people, and I don't have anything to dress. I'm wearing the clothes on the plane that I'm going to wear on the show and then wear on the plane on the red eye back, you know, that, nothing to change into. And um, anyway, so, like, maybe... Half hour before the show's supposed to start, in comes Shirley Wood, who I've never met, but she comes in and she's carrying a tumbler, like a big water tumbler, full of white wine. And she goes, drink this. <laughs> and I, I drink it, and then she's got a piece of paper where she has typed out the questions she asked me on the phone and the answers I gave. She goes, this is what you said, say these things, you know. So then I got to go out, and there's that, like, faint, you know, that multicolored curtain, the Johnny Carson curtain. I'm standing behind, I hear Johnny Carson introduce me. They pull the curtain, and I go out, and I'm on the Tonight Show. And sitting down, and there's Johnny, and there's Ed, Ed uh, No, well, next to me was Dick Cavett, uh, not, yeah, Dick Cavett, and then uh, who pointed out that night that the letters in Spiro Agnew can be rearranged to spell grow a penis. That's right. <laughs> that was his big line. Anyway. And then Ed McMahon. Anyway, and so Johnny Carson uh, uh, interviews me, and it goes great. I mean, like, it, the, everything just seems so easy. The audience is roaring, and Johnny's letting them know what he thinks is funny. And, like, sometimes we would veer off a little from the... Uh, but it's just like a fantastic experience. And, like, he kept me over, but, which everybody said, oh, John, Johnny kept you over, you know, from, for two segments. And uh, when the camera went off for the commercial, he immediately lights a cigarette. And remember, this is a do-it-yourself book. And he goes, I used to do it yourself. You can't do shit yourself. <laughs> that was my conversation with Johnny. But, and, and anyway, so then I go back to, you know, I go, get on the plane. And, and I'm like, I'm flying. Like, Anybody else here in coach been on the Tonight Show tonight, you know? <laughs> I was like, whoa, I was on air. And then I get back, and everybody, my, all my neighbors saw it, and it was like, big deal that I was on The Tonight Show. And I just thought, this is easy. You know, TV. Little did I know that that was going to be the high point of my oh, TV yeah. career. I was never, ever going to be that good again. I've been on a million TV wow. interviews since, and none of them has been as good as that one because it was, it was the best of all time was Johnny Carson. And I was, I was at a... Writers' conference a few years later, like maybe 10 years later, in, in, uh, at, at having a dinner with the David McCullough, the late historian, great writer, great guy, David McCullough. And we're talking about bad experiences we've had on TV. Uh, and the, what happens often is, um, I know you're familiar that you go on, and the person interviewing you has not read your book, and it probably has never read any book in some cases, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so McCullough, we're, we're telling stories about bad experiences on TV, and McCullough uh, uh, tells about in 1978, he was uh, promoting a book called The Path Between the Seas, which is about the, it's a wonderful book about the construction of the, the Panama Canal, and the issue, when he's going around promoting the book, the issue is the United States is going to return, not return, 
deed the Panama Canal to the Republic of Panama, and that was a big issue at the time. And he's on this show with this guy who obviously doesn't know who he is or anything. He's just reading the questions the producer wrote. And, the, and he says to David, so how do you feel about the United States turning the Panama Canal over to the Republic of Panama? And David says, I think that in a sense, the Panama Canal will always be, an Amer an Amer always be American uh, like Normandy Beach. And the guy looks really puzzled and goes, who is Norman D. Beach? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us who that was? Are you? At he didn't tell me. It was like oh, it wasn't like right. not somebody okay. famous. Okay. It was okay. just some right. morning talk but, show guy. Uh, but in addition to Carson, you've been on all of the shows. You, I've been on. You, you yeah. were people here uh, just judging the demographics. Remember Larry King? You 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 were on Larry King constantly. I was on Larry King's show many times. Um, he loved me because he didn't have to do any research for me, and he was not big on knowing who he was talking to. He's just like, funny guy, funny guy, I say something, and he'll say, say something. But I saw him uh, on his radio show. Uh, I, is Larry here tonight? Like, or is, he, he fell asleep <laughs> during the show, and it's like producer would like, so that's a pretty good gig, if you can sleep on the air. I think he was proud of the fact he didn't read the books before he interviewed the author. He said, I want to be like the audience, and I'll ask questions like the audience. Yeah, that was his, that's what he said. That's what yeah. he said, yeah. And it, it worked pretty well for him. But I'll tell you, you will, like, I'm not, I don't mean to be criticizing Larry King, because as an author, I mean, you'll do anything. You will just, you, you have no ethical standards. I want to stress this when it comes to what you do on a book tour. And I'll, I'll tell you, if I may, with this one, one story, um, and, uh, and back, Oprah Winfrey was here last week, was she not? Okay, this is an Oprah story. So you wanted, when, when Oprah had a show, you really wanted to be on the Oprah show. That was huge. Everybody wanted to be on the show. So I'm on a book tour in the 90s, and I'm in, I'm in St. Louis, at a hotel in St. Louis. And I get the call, a call from my publicist saying, um, the Oprah show wants to get in touch with you about possibly being on a panel tomorrow. So a panel is not the best because you're not like the only guest, but still, it's, you're on the Oprah show, it's better than nothing. So yeah, so the, the, uh, op the producer for the Oprah show calls me up at this hotel and says, okay, we're doing a show tomorrow about righting wrongs. So we're going to have the panel, everybody's going to confess to something they've done wrong and then make it right on the air. <laughs> so do you have something... So I'm racking my brain. Like, and what's her name? <laughs> nah. mm. so, so I came up with something. Uh, it, and it was that a few years earlier, I had been in a Hyatt hotel. And there was a sign in the bathroom. It was like a plastic, you know, tent sign. And it said, our towels are 100% cotton. Uh, should you wish to purchase a set, they are available for $75. Should you prefer to take the set already in your room, that amount will be added to your bill, which is a nice way of saying, if you steal our towels, we will charge you $75. So I stole the sign. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny, you know. I took it home, we put it in the guest bathroom. And we had, and we had it there for a few years, and every, everybody was amused by it. So I told the Oprah producer that story, and she goes, that's perfect. You'll, you'll do you'll that. Kill. You'll, you'll tell kill. that story. You'll drop the sign. We're going to have a box on the set. You'll drop the sign into the box. We'll return it to the Hyatt Hotel, and it'll be perfect, which was great, except for one thing, yeah. which is I was in St. Louis, and the sign was in Miami, and the show was the next day in Chicago. So there's no way to get the sign to Chicago. So I realized that I was staying at a Hyatt Hotel <laughs> in St. Louis. So I stole another sign, which had nothing to do with towels. It was like no smoking, but you couldn't tell from a distance. So I, I have it in my jacket pocket. I go on the Oprah show and I tell the story and everybody laughs just like you did. And then I drop this no smoking sign into the box. My point is that in a show about righting wrongs, I stole two signs <laughs> and lied. That's the kind of whore you are when you're on a, on a, on a book tour. Excellent. Excellent. Now, you... 
you have a long history of, of writing about family. Um, a long time ago, you, you picked up your son Rob from school oh, yeah. <laughs> in the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile. I did. Just to embarrass him, which is the job of parents, after all. If you ever uh, do get a chance to drive the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile, that's probably the best thing to do. And it scarred him psychologically for life, I think, but <laughs> totally worth it. Um, you wrote a book, uh, You Can Date When You're 40, about your daughter? Was that it? Did yeah. I have it wrong? Yes. Yeah. What, what, what was the gist of that? No, I mean, just, I've written a lot about my kids over the years, and that's what you kind of, that's what you do when you're a human comic, you sort of mine your own life. And it's, it's a little awkward when they learn to read, which tragically, <laughs> even in Florida, that can happen. And, <laughs> and um, so I had to deal with my kids, which, and I had it with, with both Rob and Sophie, that whenever I wrote about them, they could read the column, and if they didn't like it, they could get someone else to pay for their college education. <laughs> uh -huh. That was the deal. I think it may be time to take questions from the audience. Okay. Well, it's hard to believe they'd have any. We've covered things pretty thoroughly. Oh, here, my I, God. We've, no, we've, really. We're, we've we are here for you if you have problems at home. I think Ted has a microphone. So, real quick, um, the questions around here work like this. They typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. This is not a place where we believe in two-part questions. And tonight, only Paul gets to ask follow-up questions. Who would like to go first? Who optioned your book? Oh, it, that's an LA question. It you, is. You it's wouldn't like, get that question I would in never, any other city. And I only know because they already asked me. It was somebody like Constantine Films, something like that. Very nice. Is that a real thing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But it, I was very excited that they did that. Um, Do you ever get writer's block? Do I ever get writer's block? Um, yeah, I think every writer who writes a lot or writes for a living, um, as opposed to just for the enjoyment of it, gets writer's block. I think that's because writing is, I don't mean to compare it to coal mining, which is probably harder. <laughs> but it's, it's hard, you know, to, if you, you do it and you don't, you know, you kind of have to do it. And, and my, my feeling about writer's block is that what ha it happens to people who are very successful. They write a book, it does really well. When that happens, when you become like a writer, you can sort of coast. You can do nothing but there's conferences, there's lectures, and so on. And you can talk about writing, which is so much easier than <laughs> writing, you know? And so I think what happens is people just sort of like get into the talking about writing thing and, and not the writing part. So, but to answer your question specifically, every day is writer's block. I mean, every day, you know, I, I write pretty much every day in the morning. And whenever I sit down in front of a blank, you know, computer screen, I'm, my basic default mode is you're done. You have nothing. You're, a, you know, you're used up piece of crap. <laughs> you are never that funny to begin with, you know. And whatever you're writing is terrible. And, you know, then you just kind of, push through that and keep going because, you know, you don't have any options. You have to pay the mortgage or whatever. Um, and, and then, you, you know, if you sit there long enough, you will produce something. Uh, that's, that's my feeling anyway. It, if, you, if you give in to the either that it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's boring and you'd rather do something else, then you'll, 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 ha you'll call it writer's block. But it really isn't writer's block. It's just you gave up. I, that's my feeling. Do you guys still have the band? Oh, we forgot to talk about the rock bottom remainders. Not only do we have a band, but the man who just held the microphone over to you uh, is the manager of the band, Ted Hopti Gabber, which is. And if, if there is a harder job than that on the face of the earth than what Ted does with this band, because we are not easy to deal with. But anyway, the, um, the band, just so you know, it's a, it's a band of authors. Over the years, has had many different int uh, mutations and, and uh, permutations, but uh, Stephen King, Amy Tan, Ridley Pearson, Scott Turow, Roy Blunt Jr., uh, Greg Isles, um, I'm leaving people, James McBride, lots and lots of authors have played in this band. And some uh, real musicians, too. Some real musicians. Yeah, the, the band itself is not good. Um, <laughs> with a, it's called the Rock Bottom Remainers, and we, we, our genre, uh, which was coined by uh, Roy Blunt Jr., is hard listening music. Um, <laughs> 
But I have one caution, and Ted has heard this story before, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, my, my cautionary tale about the band is um, there are, we understand there are the bands that what they do is they, they practice the songs ahead of time. <laughs> and that's where they know what to do. And we don't do that. We just play a gig and then we go, we should have we practiced those <laughs> songs. And, but it's too late at that point, so we just go to the bar. So anyway, here's my, my cautionary tale about the band. Um, one night we played a gig in New York City. And uh, after the gig, we went to the hotel bar. And I'm just going to say it right out front. I had, I had way too many vodka gimlets that evening. It wasn't my fault. People were buying them for me. So I had no choice but to drink them. But I did drink too many of them. And, anyway, and so I was like in a kind of an addled state. And I'm sitting in between uh, two of my favorite people in the band, um, Roy Blunt Jr., just a very funny guy. And Scott DeRoe is a brilliant, interesting guy. And they're both talking, and Roy is telling these stories that are really funny, and, and Scott is telling this elaborate, detailed, kind of dramatic story about his spleen. <laughs> and I'm trying to follow both of them, but I, as I say, I've had too many vodka gummits, so I keep getting confused, because Scott is talking in present tense about whether he still has his spleen or not. And, it, and I would say, wait a minute, I thought you didn't have a spleen. He'd go, no, I don't. That's the whole point of the story. And then he'd go back to discussing it. And then I would listen to Roy for a while, and then i kind of forget. And I'd go, wait a minute, I thought, you know, I interrupted Scott like three times to, about the, condi- you know, the current state of his, his spleen. And so finally, Scott takes a Sharpie and rolls up my right sleeve and writes on my forearm, no spleen. <laughs> which solved the immediate problem. And, and so anyway, then, you know, the evening breaks up, everybody goes to bed. And we, we had to get up the next morning early to get a train to Boston to play another show in Boston. And I, so I have, but I have no memory of the night before. So I get up and I'm staggering to the bathroom and I look in the, in the bathroom mirror and I see the words, no spleen, <laughs> written on my forearm. And I have no idea how they how they got there. And you know the urban legend about, okay, there's a salesman in a hotel and a hot babe comes up and slips him a Mickey and he wakes up the next morning in the hotel bathtub packed in ice and he's got a, a note on his chest that said, we've harvested your kidney. And so like just for a few terrifying seconds, I thought, oh my God, they've harvested my spleen. And, and I don't know where to look, you know, I don't do you know where your spleen is? I don't, you know. And then, like, and my brain starts to reboot, and I realize, oh, my God, like, nobody would harvest your You don't need a spleen. That's the whole point of Scott's story. There's probably an expression in organ harvesting circles, he's so dumb he'd harvest a spleen, you know. So, <laughs> but my, my cautionary tale is, like, uh, whatever you do in life, people, go easy on the, on the gimlets. Um, <laughs> that's like, yeah. So. Well, that was a crowd pleaser. Another one. Um, I had to give a toast at a friend's 70th birthday party, and I wondered if you had any tips or any examples of toasts you've given before that have really gone over well. No. <laughs> but I do have, I do have a toast-related statement. I'm just going to put this out there. When I was young, which is like the you know, Spanish-American war was raging, but when you used to go to a wedding, like the best man gave a toast, and that was it. And then it was party time, right? Have you gone to a wedding lately? Like, everybody in the room, every people, they they bring in people off the street, gets the microphone and goes, oh, man, it was so great when we were in college, and we remember we went, and then we played beer pong that one time, and and like an hour later, they're still droning on, and it's got to stop. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but as for your friend, I, just, I would just say, hey, man, good for you. You didn't die yet, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We, we're, we've been a big fan of yours for years and years and years. Thank you. Um, and we actually listened to, you, to your book. Um, this book? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. I had yes. to read it. It took, yeah. 
it took like you, two you, years you, to read it. You narrated it. <laughs> um, so uh, I know that you, you feel that men and women have a diff different sense of humor, correct? Mm -hmm. Men and women have a difference. Well, no, I mean, men and women are very different, I feel, but yeah. they, they generally often laugh at the same things. We, well, maybe not, that's not true. They laugh at each other, I guess. So, maybe, but okay, oh, you're trying to make a point here. I'm, do you, I should, do you feel that this book was uh, more, more um, centered towards men's humor? Do you feel that way? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the phrase you're looking for, dear, is guy humor. Guy humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah well. There's a lot of guy humor here. There is a lot of guy humor. Well, I'm a guy, you know. Yeah. But you, um, have a, you have a female heroine. The, 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 you didn't like the female lead, the lady that was, who was the best, best character in the book. <laughs> oh, she was great, yeah. No. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, then I, I am a guy, and it was probably guy humor. <laughs> if you were, had some choices about casting Swamp Story. If I had what? Casting. If, if you were going to cast Swamp Story, who are some actors and or actresses oh, to play? Oh, if I were to cast... Jesse, who might you pick to play some of the roles? Well, there would have to be like... Um, God, this is L.A., isn't it? It is, it is. But, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because the thing is... The, I'll tell you, when they... When they there, there are a couple of people that... I talked to about like the rights to it and what they always say is like oh you know we're looking at uh, you know uh, we're looking at uh, Brad Pitt we're looking at you know they name all these people but I know for a fact because I've been through this before that they won't get any of these people <laughs> so I, I'm going to say I would like it to be a bunch of really unknown but really great people and pythons and python snakes yeah. <laughs> presidential politics Dave Okay, well, I, I do have a, um, I am running for president. Ted has been my, <laughs> and I guess the, the main, uh, my, the, the, the kind of cornerstone of my uh, platform is healthcare. Um, and I, I want the medical profession to find a way to get to the prostate gland other than the way they're getting to it now. <laughs> but I do have a, I have a thought about Poli the current political situation. Everybody's very unhappy with the current political situation. Um, the a majority of the, the, the public doesn't want either of the people that is most likely, most likely to be the candidates this summer. And uh, one big issue, obviously, is Donald Trump, who, um, if, all, if everything plays out the way people are thinking it's going to, he's going to be on trail, trial for having paid $130,000 to Stormy Daniels because, according to him, he did not have an affair with her which makes perfect sense. Like, why else would you pay her? <laughs> 130, and just for the record, I have never had an affair with Stormy Daniels either, which means I assume I owe her $130,000. <laughs> but it's gonna be awkward if he does run for president, so here's the solution and I've come up with, and it's win-win. Um, what we do, because he insists that he won the 2020 election, and uh, so, I don't know, Paul's the lawyer, but what the legal mechanism is, would be, but we, we get the Supreme Court to review that. And they wait until right before the 2024 election, and mm -hmm. then they declare that he did, in fact, win the 2020 election. <laughs> and he's therefore done with his second term. <laughs> and... and so, Thank you for your service, and you know, win-win, win-win. Thank you for your service tonight, pal. Yeah.